Thank you. So I'm going to talk about, uh, in terms of tools for integration, I'm going to talk about the importance of benchmarks, uh, since that is obviously very core to what FTSE Russell does. And I should probably just give a bit of context by saying that FTSE Russell is part of the, the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, we recently acquired Refinitiv, the ex-Thompson Reuters business, so we're now significantly bigger uh, than, than we were before, but we are one of the world's largest benchmark providers. We have about $16 trillion uh, worth of assets tracking FTSE uh, benchmarks. Also within the group, we have a stock exchange and we're obviously a, a key data provider uh, as, as well. But in terms of the number of assets, the scale of assets tracking uh, passive benchmarks, obviously this becomes a very important tool for the integration of, of ESG. So I want to sort of really start by highlighting the importance of benchmarks as part of a systemic and systematic approach to implementing sustainable finance, and also the ability for benchmarks to drive capital at scale towards financing sustainable companies and towards transition and low carbon uh, activities. And the other thing that I think is very important to mention here and also ties into the stock exchange partnerships and relationships that we have globally, particularly within, within APAC, um, is the possibility of driving better standards uh, across markets through the use of sustainable green and climate aligned uh, indexes. So if we can move to the first slide, please. So I wanna just start by saying something about the drivers for sustainable investment that are really kind of putting benchmarks, I think at, at center stage in terms of the integration of ESG. And there are a couple of key factors here uh, to point to. So data availability and quality um, are key. And I know that Vanessa is going to pick up on, on data. So I'm not gonna to say too much about this, except to say that from a benchmark perspective, it's a really fundamental uh, starting point for index construction. Um, benchmarks in themselves should be, uh, should be designed to be rules-based, objective, consistent, and therefore a very useful and important tool in, in integrating ESG in a way that is very uh, systematic across, across large-scale portfolios. Now, um, the other very important aspect is the client base that is served by, index, by sustainable uh, indexes, because this really cuts across both large scale universal owners, large asset owners, uh, in terms of the pools of investment capital they have on both fixed income and also on equities, uh, and, and the specific needs of universal owners uh, in designing uh, benchmarks that really you know, meet their needs from both an investment perspective, but also uh, are customized uh, often to integrate their specific uh, investment policy requirements. And the interesting thing here, of course, is that no two asset owners really start with the same motivation, although you do find some, some regional uh, convergence there. But the other very important pool of clients that this that, uh, the uh, Sustainable Investment Index serves is, is obviously the retail market, and that is becoming increasingly significant uh, with the growth of, of ETP uh, and exchange traded uh, funds. So all of this is really driving uh, towards greater innovation in this space and a multi-asset approach and leads to the integration of, of sustainability directly into, into fund products. Um, and of course we have, have had in, in recent years a, a really uh, timely and an, an interesting confluence of a, a drive towards both passive investing and sustainability that dovetail very well together. We move to the second slide. Thank you. So I want, what I really wanted to emphasize here is the range and the flexibility of benchmarks. I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the, the, the sort of drive towards for, for large asset owners of customization, of really integrating their own policies in a very kind of specific way. Um, but, I think what we see is, is sort of a widening of the approaches really, not only towards integration, but also towards uh, benchmark construction and the diversity and the flexibility of methodologies that's available, uh, that's available in this space. So there's a really wide approach to benchmark construction from very straightforward market cap weighted indexes to exclusions, um, and then driving forward towards into sort of multi-factor um, exposure to integrate um, you know, financial performance concerns directly into benchmarks alongside sustainability considerations. And we see that both in climate indexes, also in ESG indexes as, as well. So it's really you know, the, the breadth, I guess, of what you can achieve with a benchmark um, in terms of integrating sustainability and also 
alongside financial criteria and, and, and factor exposure. Uh, on the next slide, I'm gonna move on to talk about a couple of specific um, uh, methodologies and some of the newer products that we've been working with, working on, which I think gives some insight into how benchmarks can really support the implementation of sustainable investment approaches and, and policies. So I'm going to just start by going back to the data. So, so FTSE Russell is involved as a data partner uh, to the TPI, the Transitions Pathway Initiative, which is a very, I would say, significant um, asset owner led and backed initiative, which seeks to provide a benchmarking system uh, for how companies are managing the transition to a low carbon economy. And it really addresses this from, from two dimensions, both on the management quality aspect and also the, the carbon performance. So the management quality is really about the governance piece around how companies are responding to and managing the energy transition. You can just about see the, path, the, the blue pathway uh, diagram in the middle of the slide and it maps company uh, performance uh, against a number of different dimensions on a scale of, of, zero, uh, of, of zero to four. Um, and then on the carbon performance side, this is provided by the Grantham Institute at, at LSE, which calculates uh, where companies are on a warming uh, trajectory scenario and then publishes this on a, an open source data tool. But the reason I mentioned uh, that I wanted to talk about TPI was, was about its use in, in indexes. So we worked very closely with a large asset owner in the UK last year, the Church of England Pension Fund, to create an index uh, which is based on the use of TPI and provides more or less weight to companies in the index, depending on uh, how they are scoring both on that carbon performance piece, but also importantly on the management quality aspect. And we work very closely with the, the Church of England in the design and the execution of this, of this index. They had some very clear ideas about what they wanted to do with it in terms of uh, using it as an engagement tool by ensuring that we didn't uh, discriminate against different sectors. So this, this index is equally open to clients on the to, sorry to companies and issuers in the oil and gas sector as it is to those in more sort of green operating in greener or, or less carbon intensive areas and the reason for that is that they really saw it as an important part of their engagement and wanted to be able to use it as a, as a tool in their company dialogue and also to reward companies that were doing better in in managing transition risk uh, as as well so so in that sense, this provides a very important tool for engagement and also an incentive uh, for companies to, to perform better and then to get a, not only a place in the index, but also to get a better weighting in the index. Um, so it really does tie into an overall uh, responsible investment approach. Um, and we do see a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in, in both transition aligned and carbon neutrality uh, indexes as well globally, but also I think more so now in the Asia Pacific region. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. So just in terms of development, um, I wanted to wrap up by talking about the, the, the growing sophistication and significance of benchmarks in the, uh, in the, the, the net zero uh, transition and in really helping to, to meet uh, both investor, investor needs, but also I think more perhaps uh, growing significance in terms of the regional ability of, of benchmarks to help to achieve some of the outcomes and the net zero ambitions that have been stated uh, across the globe. So, I mean, you can see from, from the slide, I guess the evolution of, of benchmarks from uh, a straightforward climate approach with a low carbon, uh, maybe for ex fossil fuels uh, um, methodology to the climate transition framework that I've just described in relation to the TPI uh, and then moving into a very sort of defined uh, methodology and, and of course uh, set by, by the EU in their, um, in their climate benchmarks regulation, which specifies a level of, uh, of uh, emissions reduction that needs to take place on a year on year basis in order to achieve a particular label of either, um, uh, of either uh, Paris aligned or, or climate transition benchmarks. So obviously I, what I think is very interesting is that the EU saw this not only from a sort of labeling and product uh, perspective uh, pr product uh, confidence perspective uh, as an important part of the, the, uh, um, the uh, EU's uh, uh, green action finance plan, um, but also I think perhaps recognizing the importance of shifting assets towards these, uh, uh, these uh, low carbon and sustainable objectives uh, and outcomes. Um, I'll stop there, Chex, and, and hand back to you.
you're on mute, Chex, but I'm going to share <laughs> my screen. So hopefully you can all see this and hear me. Well, thank you everyone um, for inviting me. And I am gonna pick up on a, a few of the points that Helena just went through. So that was really interesting. Um, to start with, you know, we're really at FactSet trying to bring all of this uh, very important data together in uh, aligned with technology tools to really make it all come to life and, and help with the various workflows. So we always start out with the challenges slide. And here I'll just touch on a few things. Um, the first one is really with respect, as, as Helena mentioned, um, one of those external factors being the, the retail investor audience and, and um, home offices with this serious demand now for true ESG integration, not just sort of niche investing. Um, and from our clients' perspective, really helping them and partnering with them to find out uh, what and determine what are the best ESG data sets. Because as we know, and I'm sure was uh, discussed at length earlier today in this conference, um, that, that there are many different approaches to ESG data and and today, um, it's really about trying to figure out what is best aligned with, with uh, your investment approach. Of course, uh, the regulatory piece is, is underlying so much of this as uh, was just touched on there. And we're working with our clients to make sure that they have the right solutions to comply with these regulations. Uh, the EU being kind of first and foremost, but I know um, there are several happening in, in the APAC region as well. And um, this is just something that is gonna continue to grow and, and really influence how people are thinking about ESG. And then of course, it's how do you bring all these data sets together and really come up with, with unique solutions. So this really does come down to thinking about ESG data as, again, not a, not a separate thing, but integrated into all of our client workflows. So everything from the basic research and, and screening, uh, creating those composite scores and creating sort of your own secret sauce of how you're evaluating companies, uh, applying this data to your holdings. And that's a really important piece of what FactSet, what the FactSet platform can bring uh, together is, is having all of your holdings already in the system and being able to easily overlay these various data sets uh, to, to do your analytics and, and reporting. Of course, there's a risk management piece. Uh, corporate engagement is, is really uh, heating up. And I think in this particular AGM season, we're seeing many more shareholder proposals coming uh, to actually vote and, and having those tools to engage with companies and, and bring all this various data together in your research notes is, is really um, something that, that we're hearing a lot from our clients. Um, as we touched on, the, the regulatory piece is super important. And then just lastly here, what we're hearing a lot from our clients is that it's great to have point in time data and understanding where uh, the companies that they're investing in are in terms of their journey, but it's really now starting to focus on impact. And so not just kind of what was last year's GHG emission numbers, but what are uh, the goals and how are we reaching them? How do you quantify that impact? Um, especially when you get into more uh, factors outside of environment like social. So I'm really pleased here at FactSet that we've been able to bring together so many different data sets uh, starting with the more traditional ESG data. Um, and we're thrilled that we have uh, True Value Labs as newly part of the FactSet family. Uh, their scores are, are a great complement to the many uh, partners that we have on the platform in that they're really providing this outside in approach. So as opposed to looking just at what companies are, are reporting or being surveyed on, that they're taking vast amounts of unstructured text and finding those signals, whether it's from news, from government reports, NGO reports, uh, niche industry publications, really being able to bring to the table this external stakeholder view 
observing what a company is doing, how they're behaving as opposed to just what they're saying. So this is a, a really key data set that we're starting to weave into our, our um, full platform. And then of course we have our, our third party, our partners uh, with their ESG scores and, and benchmarks, FTSE Russell being one of them, and, and just um, recently bringing Ping On uh, on board with, with a great partnership that we're, we're starting there. Um, so it, it really is about giving our clients choice to uh, bring these various data sets together. And of course that, that can mean also with a proprietary score that that our clients are, are building in their own research. Um, we also have a number of, of adjacent uh, data sets that maybe aren't considered the traditional ESG scores, but are really important when you're bringing this all together to try to um, form a, a full 360 degree view of a company. Um, so that includes our Revere industry classifications and, and supply chain, that's sort of the the almost old school at this point, ex excluding fossil fuel companies, et cetera. Um, I touched on uh, the, the voting and our shareholder proposals. Our database uh, really helps, again, provide that view of what's happening in the, on the ground with these companies and what are the, the various initiatives that are being pushed forward. Um, private markets is a huge area for us, and we're starting to expand in that space as well. Um, and then green bonds is another area. We recently just added two new flags for social and, and sustainable to, to help, um, again, complete that, that picture. Just lastly, on this slide, I wanted to touch on uh, Street Account, which is our news commentary service. And I'm really pleased to be working with them on a, a new ESG um, analytics team. Uh, so they're going to be providing that really important context it's great to have the, the numbers and the, um, the quantifiable data, but being able to put that again in context, understanding impacts to the industry, uh, peer groups, et cetera. So really pleased about that. And so we have this great ecosystem of, of data, uh, but where the, the rubber really meets the road here is how do we make that data actionable? So again, we have um, a variety of, of various ESG data sets, um, our, our partners in this, uh, the client portfolios, and then of course the, the benchmarks, uh, very importantly, as, as uh, Helena was going through. All of this then goes through the lens of data integration. And this is really the, where the plumbing happens and, and the kind of the heavy lifting around concordance and making sure that all of these various data sets can really work together um, very seamlessly. And of course, we have QA on top of that and making sure that, that everything's sort of normalized. Um, and most recently, we've been working with uh, SASB to have that overlay, um, mapping in various data sets into the SASB um, categories and dimensions. Again, just another way to make this data kind of connect and be able to compare apples to apples. Um, across various companies and, and data sets. We're also doing the same with the sustainable development goals. Once the data is, is all there, then it really starts to come alive in our workflow solutions. Everything from portfolio analysis, as I spoke about earlier, through um, risk and research and, and screening. And ultimately being able to get this data how and where our clients want it. So whether that's in our workstation, uh, in the cloud, through data feeds and APIs, it's really about providing that flexible approach to make sure that, that um, you can really take the most action from this data and, and complete all of your workflows. So I'm gonna leave it at that and turn it back to Jess. Thank you so much, um, Helena and Vanessa. Um, I'm actually going to just jump straight into uh, the Q&A session. Um, and my, my first question is, is really about um, challenges. So because I think a few years ago, investors were really asking the question of why should we do this? Um, I, I think increasingly we don't hear people, you know, asking the why question anymore. And instead of they're, they're asking the how question. Um, and, you know, you both spoke a lot about like what's already available out there. Um, but you, you, you interface with investors a lot, your clients a lot. Um, I'm just, I'm sure the audience is also very curious to hear um, what, what are the pain points you, you've heard today 
right, from investors uh, in terms of doing this in ESG integration into their investment process. Um, maybe a few years ago, everyone was saying there was so little data, um, but now it seems like um, maybe we have uh, a lot or even too much. Um, so as Vanessa, you were saying, how do you make that actionable? It's now kind of the key question. So I would just love to um, hear from you both to expand on that point, um, just on the, you know, when you're interfacing with clients and, and investors, what are the pain points you still hear today? Um, I, I, maybe I can go first on that, Jax. Yeah. Um, well, look, I mean, you mentioned data and I'll speak from an Asia Pacific, Pacific perspective. Um, I mean, look, data is still, to be realistic, a, a pain point, certainly in this part of the world. And I would say there are a couple of reasons for that. Yes, there's more data. It's not necessarily the kind of data that is, that is needed. So if we think about sort of 85% of the CSI 300 uh, index, uh, you know, companies publishing uh, CSR reports, that, that's great. I mean, that's certainly an improvement on uh, the situation a number of years back. But I think what we're looking for now is, and I think Vanessa said this when she was speaking uh, actionable uh, data, you know, how, how do we take these insights and really turn them into something that is not only meaningful, but also comparable consistently across a broad universe. So and this goes into the whole kind of standardization of, of data uh, debate. So, you know, yes, that there's definitely more data, more companies are disclosing their scope one, perhaps scope two emissions, scope three is still, I think, far off. But, um, you know, it's really about getting a level of consistency, frankly, you know, across markets. And when you have markets that are, I'll use China as, as an example, you have 4,000 uh, listed, you know, Asia uh, issuers in, in China. I mean, getting a level of standardization there is, is not going to be uh, straightforward. I think everybody recognizes that. But, um, but that, is, I, that is still, I would say, frankly, the major issue. And I, I, you know, I do say that's from an Asia Pacific perspective, where, of course, you know, it's taken a little bit longer for sustainable investing as a concept to, to take off. But a few other things that I would point to, firstly, understanding what is material. So how do you then take those insights and, and use them uh, as part of your investment decision making, understanding the link to value? I think that's another thing. I think one of the speakers in the previous panel talked about scenario analysis, you know, understanding how carbon pricing would impact, uh, would impact a company's bottom line. So it's, it's kind of how do, how do you then get, gather those insights? And then just a final thing to, to say is um, expertise and, and knowledge uh, in the market and the whole need for a capacity building and, and for, for training. And I think there's a lot more now for those that are coming through sort of, let's say the CFA uh, system. I, I do see that there, there are a lot more opportunities to learn about how to integrate uh, ESG and what to look for. But I think that whole sort of training piece and understanding is, is another one uh, that, that is important to the industry in terms of forward development. Well, I completely agree. And I don't think that it's just an, an APAC issue. I know it's, we're kind of harping on <laughs> the classic, um, but it, I mean, it is true. And I think it, it's quite interesting that uh, a new, and so I have not delved into it yet, but uh, some important um, uh, initiatives were passed in the EU yesterday, uh, one with respect to climate related uh, reporting. And I, I think that that really is, a, a critical piece here. Um, there is a lot of data out there, and I completely agree with Helena that you know it's maybe not the data that necessarily that our clients are looking for. And I, I, I think the, the regulation piece is very important in that it's defining what data is necessary to, to meet these um, regulations and to do the disclosure. And that really involves companies reporting more and reporting more in a standard way. And so I, I, I definitely agree. Um, there's a lot of model data out there, but we're hearing more and more from clients that they don't necessarily agree or understand the methodology there. Um, and they're really looking for uh, more of that raw data. And I think that's why you're seeing even more corporate engagement from the big investors, because they're just going out and trying to get this data themselves or or try to prompt more disclosure. So that's an interesting byproduct of that. I think um, the other piece, and, and just to touch on the, on the standardization point, I think uh, I am heartened by, by what's happening with the IFRS and the new Sustainability Standards Board. I think that's gonna be critical in, again, being able to compare those apples to apples and, and bringing that all together. 
I think the other piece um, that Helena touched on as well is, is that forward looking piece. So, you know, yes, we need to get to a point where we do have uh, good GHG emissions numbers being reported, not just modeled, um, for example. But I also think that that it's now how well that, that point in time data doesn't necessarily indicate how well that company is positioned to transition to a net zero uh, future. And so I think what we're, we're hearing more is how can we get those, those um, longer term goals uh, into the system and how can we help our clients to, to understand how to track that data. And again, we need the cooperation of companies to, to be more forthcoming with, with their own data. Um, but I think that's really the, the next piece is understanding transition risk, understanding uh, more into the future, what the, the risks are and the opportunities are for our clients. Great, thank, thank you both um, for that very comprehensive answer. Um, so next, I'm also very um, curious to hear, what do you think is technology's role um, in addressing some of these uh, investor concerns that you, you just raised? Um, because I think you know you both spoke about standardization, you spoke about investors' demand for raw data points. Um, and just to, to be frank, right, it's gonna not, it's gonna take us a while for the disclosure um, effort to really to really step up. Um, before we, we get there, I think there have been a, a suit of fintech companies who all advocate, right, we, we can use uh, alternative data, for example, to fill some of these uh, disclosure gaps. And I know, um, Vanessa, for True Value Lab, that has been mm -hmm. a, a huge part of their focus. Um, yeah. But I've also heard um, from certain investors where um, I think these kind of non-disclosure based alternative data also have um, limitations because you know you can address maybe a subset of the data points, but definitely not the whole scope of, of uh, ESG indicators that investors are looking for. Um, and and you know I think both uh, Fussy Russell, um, especially with the acquisition of Refinitiv, and then also Factset. Um, are in a sense also technology companies. So can you speak a little more towards technology's role in, in helping allevi alleviating some of these concerns? Well, maybe I'll just start quickly. So uh, Chex, um, thank you for, for touching on True Value Labs. And I, I, I do see there's, to your point, there's no substitute for the raw data as being reported, right? But we have to be able to have a mechanism for more interim data points, right? Because that data is maybe at most once a year. And so I think that monitoring piece is really important. And whether it's looking at Glassdoor and you know some of the, the employee reviews, right? Through, I still believe, and my background is actually in news. So um, I have a definitely a soft spot in my heart for um, looking at news sources from around the globe and being able to find those signals. And I think that is really an important part of, of where technology can come in um, to be able to, to find things and, and look at sort of in, in aggregate at content and, and being able to find those signals. Um, I think that's really the, the biggest issue, of course, uh, for FactSet, it, it really is about the technology platform of bringing various content sets together, doing that entity concordance. Some of that plumbing work, I think, continues. Um, that's maybe not new tech necessarily, but it's really important tech to uh, be able to make this, this content um, usable by our clients. Elena? Yeah, um, uh, let me add to that then. So first, I, I definitely agree with Vanessa that there's no replacement for disclosed data. Uh, you, you know, having additional insights is really important. And, and I think it's a tool that uh, is developing more and more. And I think that's terrific for investors. Uh, I don't think that takes away from the need for companies to be measuring, monitoring, strategizing on their ESG risks and, and disclosing that to, uh, to investors. So that piece, remains very important. However, I think what we can say is that alternative data um, is bringing another dimension to analysis and it's also giving a checkpoint for investors. And again, I go back to what I said earlier about uh, the lack of disclosed data and particularly in, in emerging markets, 
you know, if there are other data sources that can provide insights, and I, I think um, Ian Sim from Impacts put it very well in, in the previous session about the need to kind of hunt down uh, insights that are then I, in an ideal world, generative to, to alpha and, and really sort of give you the edge in your investment process. Um, so, you know, I think, I think both are important. I do think we have some really exciting and interesting developments on the technology side. We think about sort of blockchain for monitoring su supply chains, for example, geothermal and, and, uh, and geospatial uh, imaging data, what that can tell us about, you know, even things around sort of uh, carbon emissions around sort of you know the, the levels of heat around buildings and, and, and factories and, and different sites so you know I think there's some really you know just fascinating possibilities about about what can be done with this uh, but we we have to make sure that you know it doesn't sort of take away from the onus of the companies to report having said that for groups like FTSE Russell and no doubt fact set uh, and, and your other partners when when you're looking at really large sets of data and pulling together a lot of information this is where NLP, natural language processing, uh, AI, uh, and so on, can really kind of come into their own to assist in that process. And certainly a layer of semantic screening, for example. Vanessa, you mentioned news flow. I mean, I completely agree with you about the aggregation of insights and, and events that can that can feed into this, uh, this process of ESG analysis, because obviously what you get from companies typically is gonna be once a year. Uh, as you said, because it aligns with, with reporting cycles. But there are lots of insights, particularly around, around news flows, uh, controversies, uh, and so on, that can really help to sort of supplement, support, and as I said, provide an edge in terms of the insights that ESG data can provide. That's great. Um, if, if I could just add to what you both um, shared, um, and as you both know, we have been working very hard in the past year and a half or so on creating the China A share data that has full coverage, you know, um, at least six years of history, and and we've used a lot a, a lot of alternative data approaches in that process. Um, and I think just to echo back to some of the things said in the earlier session and one of the audience question we didn't get to, which is, um, you know, do companies do third party auditing, right, or validation? Um, and I think um, another really important way to use alternative data is, you know, aside from filling that gap of lack of disclosure data is that validation piece. So, so for example, I think for us, we decided to use some remote sensing data. Um, you know, how, how far is factories from, you know, water sources or, or, or things like that. Um, you can use that as an indicator itself, but it could also be used as a way to validate some of the other more common E-dimension indicators. Um, we talk about greenwashing in earlier panels. Um, you know, Vanessa, you talked about news, but like, you know, that news really provide a outside in perspective, right, on what companies are doing. Exactly. If More we, unbiased. Yeah, if, exactly. And then if we can compare that with what companies are saying in disclosures, that could be a very neat way to actually do some of these uh, greenwashing de de detection that we just talked about. Um, so I just want to want to add to that. Um, we only have a few minutes. Um, I'm going to ask a uh, look into the future question to, to both of you, and maybe you covered a little bit of this uh, in your earlier answer already, um, which is what is your outlook for the next phase of uh, both ESG indices and also data development? And I ask that um, because we've been doing a lot of research on what's been happening in mainland China in this space, um, and just to share some of the very interesting data points with um, the audience, um, if we look at ESG-themed indices in China, uh, we were very surprised to see half of them were launched in 2020. So the speed is, you know, just very impressive. And in terms of data, you know, I think the availability of data providers in mainland China has a much shorter history than globally. But even just in the five years, we've seen eight different data providers popping up. Um, so, so I think that scale and increase in number and speed is quite obvious, but I'm, I'm very interested to hear from both of you, you know, maybe in addition to the speed and number that, you know, that explosive growth you're seeing, um, what are the other trends that, you know, you are excited about or you look forward to for the next phase of um, this space? 
Um, maybe I can say that as a practitioner, there, there are things that excite me. Uh, I mean, we just talked about technology, for example, but in terms of the appetite for increasing sophistication, the marriage of sort of understanding value uh, plus ESG insights and, and, and from an index perspective, uh, different methodologies that can really help to drive impact uh, and outcomes and measuring and understanding exactly what those outcomes are. So kind of getting frankly closer to the truth of ESG, uh, if you like, particularly on the climate side, but I would say, uh, if we look into the future, frankly, you know, there are kind of two tracks. I don't think you can say that there's kind of, that ESG is developing in one way. And if you're thinking about the difference between, let's say a major asset owner uh, in, in Europe versus a retail investor in China and the kind of products that they're, that they're looking for and that they understand, um, you, you know, it varies widely. So we're gonna see really a, a divergence in terms of, uh, of sophistication level of take up and understanding, but I think, what is, I think this is probably the most exciting time in terms of, you know, people working uh, in this space and the appetite for, for what we can achieve, particularly uh, on the climate front. And I'll also just, just briefly say, because I, I don't want to take up too much time here, but in terms of taxonomies, uh, the green economy and scaling climate finance towards those solutions, renewables, but also some of the energy efficiency um, uh, industry uh, elements that are that are, are very important and maybe more under the radar. I think those are the bits that I that I find I find really uh, very exciting, but also you know the ability to make a difference, particularly and I would say especially on on the climate agenda. Yeah, I, I'll I'll just pick up on that. I I think it is a such an exciting time to be part of this, and it, it is evolving so rapidly. Um, but just. The, the notion of being able to provide more transparency, whether it's from the company level or at the at the financial product level, I think with obviously at the heart of a lot of the regulation, but it's so important to really understand uh, what companies are doing and 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 what direction we're moving in and what the impact is. And uh, so I think from that perspective, it is a really exciting time that we're starting to get to more of that transparency and and understanding. Uh, I think the, the other piece is really being able to bring together all of these various data sets in a way that, um, you know, adds value. I think uh, we're certainly seeing that a lot from, from our customers and, and being able to do that in a way uh, through the lens of these different standardizations. I have to say I'm a data person. So, you know, having, uh, seeing these advances in standardizing the way that that you even define GHG emissions, right? Even that is actually sort of, you know, not particularly um, easy to, to determine. And there's a lot of uh, assumptions that are made um, sort of underneath there. So I think having that standardization is, um, is a really critical piece and, and being able to then bring that all together. Um, so I, I'm very excited going into the future that, that we're able to support our clients in, in starting to integrate this into every phase. I mean, that is ultimately the, the best outcome here is that ESG isn't a separate thing. It's just part of how people invest and how they think about companies. Um, and so it's just completely integrated into every, every part of, of the investment process. And that to me is the, is the future and where we're going to have the most impact. Great. Um, I really hope we, we get there soon. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you both um, for sharing. So we, we're actually right on dot at the end of our session. So thank you both so much again for, for sharing with us today.